Good evening. Uh, my name is Akshay Saxena, as you heard, and I spend most of my time helping high school students study math and science. We live in a fairly unequal world, right, where who you become is so much a function of where you were born. And if you think of our schools, they play this really strange role in all of this, right? On one hand, they're beacons of hope. I'm yet to find a parent that does not believe that a quality school education is going to transform their child's life. At the other end of the spectrum, though, I would wager that schools are amongst the most significant factors in driving social class. There are schools that are haves and there are schools that are have-nots, and so are people. And why is this? Let me wager a guess. I believe the single biggest reason this is is because of what we expect our teachers to do. We expect our teachers to be superheroes. Kind of like that. Right? We expect them to do these two really disparate functions really, really well. We expect them to be like books, you know, bastions of knowledge, being able to lecture someone at the drop of a hat on a subject that they're supposed to be experts in. On the other end, we expect them to be spectacular coaches inspiring, motivating, making kids want to jump out of bed in the morning and come to school and make something of their lives. India is short a million teachers. One million. It seems like a preposterous number. We've shot a million teachers. The odds of us finding one million superheroes, close to zero. For the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you my story and the story of our company and, and how we believe that there is a solution, that we don't need to find a million superheroes. We need to do something different. So about four years ago, my co-founder and I started Avanti, a nonprofit, with a rather simple hypothesis. Right? If you get smart, motivated kids, access to good teachers, they'll do well. Seems like a truism, should happen all the time. So we went ahead and tried to do this. We created a program where we found a lot of really, really smart, low-income kids. We put them in the most expensive after-school programs that money can buy. Yeah? And we also created a huge network of volunteers at the IITs and other top schools who would mentor them and work with them. As we started to do this, we started you know, getting a lot of other smart kids say, tell, telling us, you should do the same for us. The only challenge was that these kids were in the middle of a village in Pondicherry. Uh, and at this point, you know, we, were, we were at a loss because we could not find any smart, good teacher who would travel and live in this rural part of, of the country. So we told them the best thing we could think of telling them. We gave them a bunch of books, we gave them some video content, and we told them to study by themselves in groups. So we had these two groups of kids, right? One who we are doing a lot for, another who we basically left by themselves. So about a year into this, we, we, we tested both these groups against each other. And when the data came back, I literally sat in my chair with my hand in my head and kind of started kept smacking my forehead. Because what I saw was not making any sense to me. The kids in Pondicherry, which is the yellow curve, did way better than the other kids. Way better. And not only did they do way better, they also moved as a class. You'll see that that curve is much narrower. Whereas our other kids in conventional classroom programs were kind of moving apart, as it has happens in classes. The front bench is going one way, and the back bench is going another. This really made us question what we were doing, because if you, if you think of it from our perspective, what we were learning was that doing nothing with kids was actually better for them than doing everything we were. So we started talking to people who knew something about this. We went to them and said, look, we have this group of students who are studying by themselves and they're outperforming the best teaching we can buy. And when we started talking to people who knew something about this, we realized that we were quite naive because if you look at the data in education, none of this should be surprising at all. Let's take a look at what the kids were doing in the classrooms. For about 90% of their time, someone was lecturing at them. Right? Someone was standing just like I am in front of you and talking at them for hours on end. 
about mundane, weird things like you know, the Van de Graaff generator, right? And the best study that I could find that summarizes what students feel when they're in class, and those of you who are students would probably agree or disagree and it'd be nice to see, was a study that happened at MIT a, a couple of years ago where they fitted these sensors on a bunch of undergrads and made them go through their week. So they went, went about their daily chores, they went to class, they went to sleep, and the sensor was able to measure how stimulated they were. So when they were really stimulated, there was a spike in the curve. When they were not stimulated, it was flat. So take a look at this graph. I want you to pay careful attention to the parts that say class and the parts that say sleep. The conclusion I can draw by looking at this and then you, is that students are kind of more awake when they're dreaming than when someone's lecturing at them. <laughs> and think about that, that's per perplexing, it makes no sense. Now look at TV, brain dead, right? Look at lab and homework. Most people don't like doing those two things, but look at how stimulated kids are. And if you start looking at evidence that's, that talks about lecturing, and I worked in medical devices before, if lecturing was a drug, it would get pulled from the market in a month. There's no evidence, right? There is, however, tons and tons of evidence that says that when students sit together and work together on a bunch of stuff, whether it's plays or, or the sciences or the arts, they do incredibly well. They're more stimulated, they come up with cool things. And perhaps the most pertinent research we found was coming out of Harvard University. And there's a group there run by uh, Professor Eric Mazur, who's the Dean of Applied Physics there. And for two decades, Eric has been trying to find ways of not lecturing his class. You could say he's kind of lazy and doesn't want to be there, but you know, he's really, really trying hard to get his kids to not need him. And what he's found is that when he lets his students spend 80 or 90% of their time working together, they do about 20% better than they were doing when a Harvard professor was lecturing them. Right? And, and think of the implications for education, right? It's, most people who run schools should be having the same reaction that I had you know, when we got the data back, which is we've designed this system, these requirements for teachers, you know, accreditations, all keeping in mind that someone needs to come, stand in front of a class, and, and, and spout knowledge at them. And there's very little evidence that says that's a good idea. So we started doing things a little bit differently, and I'll show you a short video. There's no audio, so I can talk through it. So, so try and think through what's happening here. And if there was audio, it would go rumble, rumble, rumble. The kids would start yelling at each other in a bit. Right? You see, see the kids are getting really agitated, they start arguing with each other, and in a minute, we'd ask them to vote again. Right? So what happened here? So this is one part of what we do in class. Right? So rather than lecturing you on the principles of mechanics, I'll throw up a question, something that, you know, is challenging, is conceptual, doesn't require a lot of numerical work. You think about it, you'd answer it, you talk about it with your peers, you answer again. That's one activity we can do. And, and by doing, spending about 80% of the classroom hours this way, we just don't need anyone with subject expertise in the classroom. Right? So this is how our classes run. For most of the week, for five days out of six, the students just sit through class, work on problems together, work on projects together, do exercises such as these. They're, they're, they're managed not by a teacher, not by someone with a postgraduate degree in science and math, but managed by often a person who's a, who's a social worker. Our requirement is literally, if you can come to me and show me that you can work well with kids, I will let you run my classroom. And then we leave the subject expert for one day a week, where they come in and they answer doubts, and what we find more often than now, not is that the questions that kids come up with are no longer, sir, I can't solve question four on page 16 of my physics book. It's completely useless to learning, asking this question. But they'll now come and ask a question where, sir, I argued for five hours with this guy and he's you know, a complete moron and I can't convince him that this is how something works. That's the kind of conversation you want students having with people who know the subject. Right? So this, this, these two groups I talked about you know, a, a while ago took the IIT exam last year. 
right? So this is, in my mind, the most competitive, hardest standardized test on the planet. Fortunately, it's also one of the few tests that actually does check for some conceptual understanding and clarity. So the kids in Pondicherry, this group of kids who we left by themselves and did all of this with, 40% of them got into IIT. Right? What that means is that 40% of them placed in the top 1% in the country. What's even more startling, 95% of them placed in the top 10% in the country by studying by themselves. This made them two and a half times more likely to succeed at this ridiculous test as kids who we were spending tons of money on and getting people to lecture. Right? It really does give, us, give, you, give one pause, right? You really have to think about this. We've designed a system to get people who are subject experts to come and lecture at people. That doesn't work. You leave kids by themselves, they do really well. What does this mean for education? Does it mean we don't need, don't need schools anymore? Does it mean we don't need teachers anymore? Another thing is happening that further confounds this question. Last year was the year of the MOOCs. For those of you in college, you've probably come across Udacity, Coursera, Khan Academy for school children. The premise people formed was, if lecturing is not that useful, why don't kids just learn everything online? And the, and the data that came back most of it this year said the following. If you really need to learn something and you take one of these courses, only one in a hundred of you will actually pass. Right? So what this is saying is, is, is probably the answer to my first question, which is, of course we need schools. Of course we need teachers. Right? Because if you leave kids by themselves entirely with a computer in front of them, they don't learn either. But what we need to do is really think carefully about the paradigm of knowledge that we that, and the way we structure it in schools. What we need to do is change the conversation from teaching knowledge, facts and questions and, and figures, to teaching students how to learn. And the moment you make this change, you no longer need someone to be a master of physics to teach physics. You don't need teachers to be superheroes. You can delink good education from subject expertise in the classroom. And what you can then focus on is instead of multiple set of you know, spider skills, all teachers in classrooms need to do is be excellent coaches. In most classrooms, all teachers need to do is sit with kids, inspire them, get them to work on problems together, and give them access once in a while to someone who knows a subject deeply. Before I finish, I want you all to think back to your, the time you were in school. And I want you to come up with the name of your favorite teacher. Just your favorite teacher. Shouldn't take people too long, right? For most of us, it's quick recall. So and so. Okay? Teachers who inspired us, motivated us. I'm sure there was at some point in your life you wanted to go to school because someone was so good. And I think we're getting fairly close to a world where you could be with that one teacher for the entirety of your school education. Not for a year or two because you've sort of outgrown their subject knowledge. Okay? We could live in a world where we could go about finding a million people who were great teachers, great coaches, without having to worry of, about whether they've taken 20 years of physics. And I believe then we can find the million teachers we need. Thank you. <laughs>